Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, reporting live from the Center for American Progress in Washington, D.C. Today, we're going to talk about Trump's chumps. You know who they are, the people that continue to support Donald Trump in the face of really all evidence to the contrary. Who are they? What do they care about? Why do they have this blinding loyalty? What is it about Trump's chumps that make them impervious to fact, impervious to reason? Why would they be that way? Are they so devoid of human understanding and basic empathy and humanity that, well, they just want to join the stormtroopers? Are they hurting economically depressed people who are just in a, in a scream trying to um, be heard? Are they racist people for whom uh, the equality of uh, blacks or women, so white men who really, um, uh, really don't believe in equality for all, really don't believe in equal justice? Who are Trump's Trumps? And why do I call them that? Why are they chumps? Well, I think the the basic reason is because they um, they're getting fooled. They're getting played. Economically, the vast majority of people in Trump's orbit are suffering precisely because of Donald Trump. Even though Barack Obama delivered probably the greatest economy given from one president to another in American history, at least than I could think of, um, maybe hmm, Roosevelt to Truman, we were in World War II, that's not a clear example, but it's really hard to think of another example uh, of a president who delivered such a fantastic economy. In some sense, Bill Clinton did to George Bush, but already there were declines in 2000. This is a fantastic economy if you hold stock. Because if you hold stock in various multinational corporations, you're getting a massive tax cut. And those, of course, could be foreigners as well who hold stock. But even stockholders are having trouble. The trade wars that Trump is beginning against our allies in Canada and the European Union are destined to harm our economy. And if you're an American worker, you've already felt the suffering. Not only have wages stopped going up despite record low levels of unemployment bequeathed by, by President Obama, but they've actually declined. Real wages are going down and have been going down under Donald Trump. It is precisely a transfer of wealth from the middle class to international stockholders, to the very wealthy both in the United States and abroad, and at the cost of a massive debt that we all are going to have to pay back. So economically, people are suffering under Donald Trump. Consumers are suffering. They no longer have the protections uh, against fraud that existed under the Obama era. They have to drink dirtier water and breathe dirtier air because clean air and clean water standards that used to exist under Barack Obama are being routinely removed uh, from regulations in Trump America. So we live in a dirtier world. We're making less money. We're struggling. Our great economy is starting to falter. Even inflation is starting to increase. We are starting on the path really where we were in the 1970s, where we're going to have higher unemployment and higher inflation. Now, to be fair, and I do have a degree in economics, so I'm not just talking in a microphone, um, most economic proposals take two years or so to work them way, their way through. Donald Trump became president in 2017, so the full thrust of its policies haven't affected us yet. But we're getting there. We're on our way. People are not better off because of Donald Trump. So who are the Trump chumps? Who are the people that believe every word Donald says, even when he contradicts himself? They believe him when he says A. They believe him when he says not A. They believe him simultaneously when he says things that are contradictory. Just this week, Donald Trump first said that he didn't believe Russia had anything to do with meddling with the elections. 
And he didn't believe our intelligence officers at all. He believed the strong and decisive words of Vladimir Putin. He believed everything the Russian dictator had to say. You could take that to the bank until the next day when following criticism by lots of people, uh, every Democrat and quite a few Republicans, um, particularly the Republicans that are dying or leaving office, they were the strongest, uh, John McCain and so forth. Um, then he changed his mind, it seems. I mean, he read from a piece of paper that was written to him by his staff saying he did believe our intelligence officials that said that Russia meddled in our election. And then he ad-libbed saying, or possibly other people. But then he walked the walk back back the next day and said, no, 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 no. When he answered the question, no, as to uh, whether or not um, he would um, he 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 believed Russia met on the election. He said, "No, no, no, I was just saying I'm not taking any more questions." No, I do believe. I believe, believe. I believe our intelligence officials. He said. And then he said, "Well, but he might consider Vladimir Putin's offer to turn over to Russian intelligence an American ambassador for questioning." I don't know. Does that include waterboarding? Yeah, he was considering the idea. Um, it was a great idea, he thought, to, one, let Russia meddle in the Mueller investigation. So I want you to think about that. He wants to let Russia meddle in the investigation into Russia meddling into our election. Did you follow that? Um, and at the same time, he wants to take a former ambassador to Russia, an American, and submit them to Russian interrogation. Uh, when Sarah Huckabee Sanders, his press spokesman, was asked about that, she said, I don't know. Um, I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Um, maybe the president does want to submit a U.S. ambassador to questioning by a hostile foreign power. Um, but then when a lot of criticism came down, he, he, he switched that one, too. But um, just yesterday, and excuse me if you need a um, diagram to walk through this, he walked back the walk back of the walk back of the walk back. OK. And said that actually he doesn't believe that Russia meddled in our election. It's all a witch hunt. Those 17 intelligence agencies, it, the ones run by people that he himself appointed that were approved by Congress, by the Republicans in the intelligence agencies, um, all of them are liars. All of them, all of them, every single one of them is a complete traitor to their country. But Vladimir Putin, Putin in Putin, we trust. In Putin, we trust. There's nothing we trust more than the evil empire. The, the, the very empire that Ronald Reagan said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Vlad, uh, Donald Trump stood right next to Vladimir Putin, said something similar. He said, Mr. Putin, do what you want, but can I please have the soccer ball? Please? Yeah, yeah, take Syria. Massacre a million people there. Kill, poison a bunch of people in London. Hey, feel free to invade any, any European country you want. Not just Ukraine, which you have a treaty with. Invade NATO. Yeah, go for it. Ah, uh, there's this country called Montenegro that I've never heard of until Tucker Carlson mentioned it to me. Take that. We don't give a damn for our allies or our treaties. Canada is a threat to our national security. Mr. Putin, give me that soccer ball and do what you want with the world. Yeah. But here's the question. Not is Donald Trump being compromised by the Russians. By the way, if you haven't heard the wonderful interview I did with the uh, national intelligence um, agent, uh, with uh, former National uh, Air Force intelligence security officer, Cedric Layton, uh, listen to last week's show. We go into detail at exactly how the Russians practiced compromat and exactly how they compromised Donald Trump. But even if you don't believe in compromat, the question is, why do Trump's supporters continue to believe every word he says, even when he contradicts himself? They may not even know where he stands. Sometimes he says two plus two is four. Sometimes he says two plus two is five. And they will tell you, Whatever Donald Trump says is the truth, even if Donald Trump contradicts Donald Trump. Where does blind loyalty come from? And why is Trump so successful at it? There are others who are successful at blind loyalty. 
Uh, the first person that I can think of is um, Jim Jones. Do you remember the Reverend Jim Jones? He's the one who created Jonestown in Guyana. Remember him? He's the one who persuaded all of his hundreds of followers living in a commune to drink the Kool-Aid. That's where the expression comes from. And in the Kool-Aid that he prepared was some kind of poison. I think it was arsenic. And they all drank the Kool-Aid and they all died because they all believed. Is it, is it charisma? Is that what's convincing Donald Trump? C convincing his supporters? I mean, remember, this is a guy who convinced people to watch a bunch of YouTube videos and pay him $30,000 to go to Trump University. This is a guy who would regularly buy 100 pianos for his building and then just not pay the bill. Trump's chumps included banks who he would borrow money from, not pay it back, go bankrupt until he finally had to rely on Russian banks and the Deutsche Bank, which was connected with Russia, in order to get loans. Indeed, it is largely those loans, as we talked about, that explains the dramatic hold that Vladimir Putin has on Donald Trump today. So there have been lots of Trump's chumps throughout his life. In fact, he has made basically a living off of being a con man. But what is it that causes his unique group of supporters to stay so loyal to him? Let me posit a few things, and then we'll come back after the break and discuss it. One, racism. Racism, misogyny, hatred of foreigners, also called xenophobia. Hatred of people who are different, anti-Semitism, homophobia. Simply not trusting someone who doesn't look like you, act like you, think like you. How much of, how much of it comes from that? How much of it comes from the conspiratorial mindset of Joe McCarthy that he very much got support from in the 1950s, or George Wallace, racist and conspiratorial, got in the 1960s, or Richard Nixon and his Southern strategy? How much of this is just a continuation of really Republican politics as has been practiced for the last half century. How much of it is Fox News? How much of it is it a conservative media that regularly tells things that everyone in that media knows to be lies? Sean Hannity every single day says things that Sean Hannity knows to be untrue. He'll, he'll flip-flop in a moment's notice. Whatever works for him, he gets power from that because he gets a close relationship with the president because he's the president's chief toady, chief brown noser. But why do people believe it? And why do they refuse to turn on respectable news sources like CNN or the Washington Post or the New York Times? Or news sources that have been around for a century. Well, maybe not CNN. But New York Times, Washington Post have been, you know, the respected, even the Wall Street Journal which its editorial page is very right-wing, its reporting is well-respected. Why won't they read the Wall Street Journal? I want to talk about who Trump's chumps are and why they're so loyal to him. And if you want to call in, it's 888-48-MARK, 888-48-6275. I'll be right back right after this. He's a Harvard economist and a Yale lawyer. He does not keep up with the Kardashians. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Hey there, it's Rebecca Vallis from Off Kilter here on the Progressive Voices Network. When I'm not hosting a radio show, I spend my days at the Center for American Progress, the nation's leading progressive think tank. My job is to generate... Facebook audience, if you want to call in, in it is 888-488-6275, 888-488-6275. Please, please call on in. And immigration. Check out our ideas online at AmericanProgress.org and find us on Twitter at A-M-P-R-O-G. My son had been injured and he was prescribed pain opiates. No one ever told us how highly addictive these drugs were. My reaction was shock. My son didn't get so deep into the dark, scary woods overnight, and there's no straight line coming back for past. 
parents out there who don't have hope. I realize there's a lot of families that are torn apart, but families can heal. Young people can get better. There's hope and help at drugfree.org. A message from Partnership for Drug-Free Kids. What makes us Americans is what we do in tough times. Knock us down, we get back up. Americans stand up to tyrants and bullies. Freedom, equality, justice. Out of many, one, work hard, do what's right. Pride in ourselves and our country. It doesn't matter the color of our skin, what our parents did, or where we were born. Irish, Italians, Mexicans, Germans, Chinese, Salvadorans, Indians, Haitians. Our melting pot forges the American dream. And that dream keeps America going. It makes us strong. Trump ended that dream. And congressional Republicans failed to act. Isn't it time we had a Congress willing to make the dream real? I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1913. That was the day 9,000 copper miners in the Keweenaw region of Upper Peninsula, Michigan, went out on strike. Organized by the Western Federation of Miners, the strike raged on for over eight months, witnessing devastating tragedy in a Christmas Day fire and ending in bitter defeat. The strike was waged over basic issues like the eight-hour day, higher wages, mine safety, and union recognition. But strikers were also fed up with the company's paternalism and intrusion into their personal lives. They also worried for their jobs with the introduction of labor-saving machinery. The Western Federation of Miners succeeded early on in shutting down the mine. But the copper barons wouldn't budge. By August, many mines reopened with stab labor. Later that month, deputies shot two strikers dead and wounded two others as they returned home from attempting to collect strike benefits. The incident became known as the Seberville Massacre. Striking miners were absolutely devastated when on Christmas Day, 73, mostly children, were trampled to death during a Christmas party and benefit at the Italian Hall in Calumet. Witnesses remembered seeing a man with a Citizens Alliance button just moments before someone yelled fire that caused the stampede. Soon after the Italian Hall disaster, Western Federation of Minor President Charles Moyer was shot by a Citizens Alliance mob, then loaded, bleeding, onto a train bound for Chicago. By April, the union was broke, the strike was broken, and the miners resolved to return to work. Bosses would only rehire strikers once they had turned in their union cars. The copper mines in the region would finally be organized some 30 years later in a campaign led by Mine Mill during the years 1939 to 1943. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com. Ready. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. I was actually just reading an email from a cousin of mine. My cousin is one of Trump's, Trump, Trump's chumps. Let me say that right. Trump's chumps. And, and I think he's illustrative of a typical Trump chump. Um, Trump chumps refuse to listen to legitimate news sources because they don't want to be dissuaded by the lies. So they won't even consider alternative facts. If Trump says two plus two equals five, they say two plus two equals five. Don't show me math. I won't look at your calculations. It cannot be true. My, my what? My Fuhrer, my soul, my leader, my boss, my brain refuses to say anything different. What is it about Trump chumps? I would suggest to you there's certain characteristics you can find of virtually any Trump chump these days, and certainly most of them. The vast majority of them are racist. They are scared of people different from themselves. They are people who do not look at any news source other than Fox News and right-wing news sources. And most importantly, they have what you might call an authoritarian mindset. These are sheeple. 
They are people who like to be told what to do and really relish being part of a movement. It doesn't really matter whether the movement is true or false. Again, look at the followers of the Jim Jones cult, right? Who eventually led them all to their deaths. Trumpists are people who will not use critical reasoning, either because they don't have critical reasoning function or because their emotions trump, pardon the play on words, their emotions trump logical reasoning. The question is, why is it so? The question is, why do people give up critical reasoning? My cousin just emailed me and told me something that is false, provably false. He said that the FISA warrant was entirely based on um, the, um, uh, the um, dossier. Steel dossier. Thank you, the steel dossier, which wasn't true. But the FISA warrant is 400-something pages long. Prior to stating a truth, he would have to read 400 pages or at least read a reputable news source like the Washington Post, the New York Times, or frankly, a local newspaper or the AP Associated Press. They're not very political. It's much easier to believe your own lies if they're continually repeated by the people you want to believe. This is exactly the lesson that Nazi propagandist Joseph Goebbels, Goebbels taught us. It's why the big lie succeeds. It's why Putin succeeds. We'll talk more about it when we come back. 888-48 Mark, back after this. My name is Mira Batra. I have been in this country 32 years, and this is how I live united. America has always been the land of promise, and in my community, many families have come for a better life. Coming from another culture myself, I know the desire to become part of a community, to feel at home, and to gain the tools for our children and families to succeed. So I advocate for these families with United Way. United Way empowers them to look beyond their histories and to see what opportunities are available. We help them get involved with their kids' schools, network within the community, and when we do, we, Be right back, them, Facebook audience. we make the community stronger. What I do is something I wish someone had done for me, and I am so grateful I am able to. My name is Meera Batra. I help families see opportunities and succeed. I don't just wear the shirt. I live it. Give. Advocate. Volunteer. Live United. Go to liveunited.org. Brought to you by United Way and the Ad Council. <laughs> there are some moments only the forest can inspire. Find yours at discovertheforest.org. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Whether you're listening to me, Mark Levine, every Monday and Thursday, or me, Leslie Marshall, each Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday, you can hear us from 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. Here's a sample of what you'll hear. The legislative representative for the United Steelworkers, the USW. We have Anna Fenley joining us. Would you say, in your professional opinion, Anna, that Brett Kavanaugh's record with working people and their families basically shows that Kavanaugh on that bench would be a threat to workers and certainly to OSHA. Absolutely. I mean, Judge Kavanaugh has what I would consider a dangerous record as far as workers and working people and his support and his, his past decisions that have supported the wealthy and supported employers at the expense of working people. There's also more clear evidence and I think it's even clearer when you see the kind of checks the Koch brothers are writing to uh, Republicans and to help this guy get on the bench that Kavanaugh is not just a friend to, but he's over-friendly to corporate America and hostile to workplace safety. So in other words, over-friendly to the rich, the corporations, hostile to the hardworking men and women, the blue-collar middle-class workers that make up the majority of this nation. He's, um, he's been criticized over many years um, for his so-called activist opinions. Um, and I think that working people uh, expect someone at the Supreme Court to be fair and independent and mainstream. And there are just so many red flags that you've mentioned in a number of areas of issues, but particularly for working people, um, for their rights to organize, for their rights to a safe workplace. Um, he has a number of cases that are just very concerning that, that he um, wrote opinions on over during his time on the D.C. Circuit. I was recently in San 
San Diego, and my children asked me why we couldn't go to SeaWorld. And I told them about what happened in 2010. A killer whale didn't just drown a SeaWorld trainer, he dismembered her. Her name was Dawn Branchow. OSHA proved we'll be back in just a few minutes. Actually, more like from previous incidents and close calls. 30 that seconds. All of the killer whales were dangerous. Hello, they're killer whales and in tanks, right? And the D.C. court, the circuit court, decided two to one in favor of OSHA. The majority's opinion upholding OSHA's action was written by Circuit Judge Judith Rogers, also a judge you may have heard of, Merrick Garland, who was the lone dissenter opposing OSHA's citation, Circuit Judge Brett Kavanaugh. But to me, you're clearly siding with a corporation. You know, this is not a constitutional issue. To me, this is very common sense. Again, that's Mark Levine every Monday and Thursday. And Leslie Marshall each Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. 3 to 4 p.m. Eastern Time on the Progressive Voices Network. And now, the voice of reason in an unreasonable world. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking about Trump's chumps. Who are they? Why do they fall for his BS? And what will it take, if anything, to dissuade them? It's important to recognize that these authoritarian tendencies have existed throughout American history. This is not something new. Yes, we've never had a demagogue elected president before, but we have had demagogues in American history. And of course, what's a demagogue? A demagogue is someone who uses popular fervor and a bunch of lies to obtain personal power, usually based on some fraudulent idea. Maybe the famous demagogue, most famous demagogue in American history is Joe McCarthy. It's where the term McCarthyism comes from. Joseph McCarthy was a Republican senator from Wisconsin in the 1950s. In 1950, Joe McCarthy was running for re-election. He was a junior senator from Wisconsin. It was supposed to be a very close race. He didn't really have an issue, um, but he did go out with his staff he pretty much decided his issue was going to be widening the St. Lawrence Seaway. Boring, but, uh, you know, very important for shipping from Wisconsin that ships could get out of the seaway. That was his issue. But Joe McCarthy liked to drink. And one night, drinking with his staff, they talked about, you know what we should do? <laughs> Imagine them drinking. We should claim, get this, that there are a bunch of communists Russian Soviet communists, Americans who are secret communists in the government, secret agents helping Russia. Let's do that because that'll make a bunch of people really angry and then they'll support us. They all started drinking and went home with a hangover. The next day, Joe McCarthy had to change planes. At that time in the early 1950s, you couldn't get across the country in a single plane uh, very easily. Most planes, most jet airliners, had to refuel. He was on a refueling stop in West Virginia. And kind of as a nod to his staff, as a funny joke, kind of to see, I guess, how far it would go, he pulled out a laundry list, literally a laundry list of what he was going to take to the cleaners. You know, two pairs of pants, five shirts, a tie. He pulled out his laundry list and he said, I have here a list of 17 communists secretly in the U.S. government, secret agents for Russia. Wow. The press had a field day. They loved it. Oh, my God, this was big news. No one else had such a thing before. Uh, Joe McCarthy, can we see your list? No, no, I'm not going to show you my list. They're secret agents. Why would Joe McCarthy know and not, I don't know, the FBI or investigators or the CIA or anyone else? I don't know. Never did show his list. Kind of the way Donald Trump never did show that group of people that they he was sending to analyze Barack Obama's birth certificate. Remember them? He was sending a whole group of people who tell him that there's real danger, real, real, real challenge to whether Barack Obama was born in Hawaii or not. What are their names, Donald? Oh, don't worry about it. One of the easiest ways to tell a liar from someone who tells the truth is when they say they say something specific. I have a list of communists. I have sent specific people to investigate 
Obama's birthplace. And then you say, well, what are their names? And they're like, uh, 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 gotta go, bye. Most demagogues are, are not just liars, they're stupid liars. Liars that most of us who have the capacity for, region, for reason can easily see through those lies. But Joe McCarthy had a lot of power. His lies kept growing. Until by 1954, in just four years, he had established the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Think of that name, the House Committee on Un-American Activities. I would argue that um, believing Vladimir Putin and allowing him to um, help dissolve NATO, I'd say that's an un-American activity. But in any case, this was the committee, and they blacklisted hundreds, thousands of Hollywood actors and authors and novelists on the false claim that they were communists. And McCarthy would say, Owen Lattimore in the State Department is a communist. And Owen Lattimore would say, uh, no, I'm not a communist. And the press would preach both sides of the controversy and not report on the fact that actually there was no evidence to support McCarthy's claims. Today, the press, the mainstream press knows better. They learned from the McCarthy era. I actually did a whole paper on this, by the way. This was my high school thesis. Um, I spent the whole year researching this. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the Associated Press, reputable news organizations do not print claims without evidence. And when claims are made without evidence, they say, Trump said this today, it is false. They didn't do that in the 1950s. They printed both sides. Today, if you want to get Trump's side without the corrections to say this is a lie, this is false. Well, there are certain conservative news outlets that do that. Fox News, Breitbart. You know them. And people who want to believe it won't look at the other side of the argument. Why not? Why this rush to believe? Fast forward a decade, George Wallace, ran for president of the United States. George Wallace, governor of Alabama, stringent, absolutist opponent to desegregating the schools. The Democrats, remember, remember, Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. He was a Republican. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt wanted to protect the environment. He was a Republican. In the 20s, Democrats were the big racist party. They're the ones who Ku Klux Klan and the South was part of, not Republicans. But this began to change with uh, liberals like Franklin Delano Roosevelt and even more with liberals like John F. Kennedy. And the moment Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, he said, because he was a smart guy, I'm giving up the South for a generation. Lyndon Johnson knew that there were a lot of white racists that were in the Democratic Party, and he was going to lose a ton of them. And he was right. They all went over to the Republican Party. Didn't happen right away, though. In the election of 1968, you had a Democrat, Hubert Humphrey, you had a Republican, Richard Nixon, and that you had the Dixiecrats. And they supported George Wallace, former governor of Alabama. And he got several electoral votes, I think like 40-something? Trying to remember. Maybe more, maybe 70-something, if I can do my math right quickly. It was a lot. Last third-party candidate to get a substantial number of electoral votes. And Richard Nixon said, aha. The Democrats have pushed those racists away by giving blacks equal rights. We can get them. We can claim them. And so he started aping George Wallace's rhetoric. He started talking about law and order and states' rights, and everyone knew that meant keep the blacks down, but it was crass to say keep the blacks down. He'd just say law and order and states' rights. And he actually took from George Wallace's base. Wallace was mad at him. How dare Nixon steal my base like that? But he did. So by 1972, he won a landslide with the traditional Republican voters and this new large Southern racist party that still continues to this day. So racism has built the modern Republican Party. And it is a weird thing that poor whites would focus their attention on poor blacks rather than on, I don't know, rich coal miners, uh, boss, you know, coal owners and owners of uh, large farming operations and the other people who really do mistreat them, try to destroy unions, 
pollute our, our streams and, and our air. Why not go after them? Well, Lyndon Johnson told us why not. He said, if you tell the lowest white man that he's better than the best colored man, he'll do anything you want him to do. He'll even let you pick his pockets. And whether or not Richard Nixon or, frankly, Donald Trump read what Lyndon Johnson wrote, it remains true to this day. And this is also not unusual in world history. In world history, powerful people have often attained their power by causing less powerful people to fight each other. Divide and conquer. I can tell you that in Poland in the 16th century, uh, the Jews were first not allowed to live in Poland. Then they were allowed to live in Poland, but only if they did what the local lords wanted them to do, which was to collect taxes from the peasants. And when the peasants rode up, rose up, they didn't kill the local lords. They killed the Jews who were collecting the tax money. Problem solved. Get people to hate each other. So this is an old device. And it's working now. And it's working with a certain group of sheeple, shall we say. I won't call them people. I'll call them sheeple because they act like sheep. People who want to follow a strong leader. Let's face it. It's easier not to think for yourself. Let someone else do the thinking for you. Critical thinking is a skill, and not everyone has it. And not everyone's taught it, and not everyone's good at it. There's even something in science called the Dunning-Kruger effect, which says that some people aren't smart enough to know that they're not smart enough to know. It actually makes a little bit of sense. People who don't know much tend to be more sure of themselves than people who know a lot. If you're well-read, you know that there's very little black and white in the universe. A lot of it's gray, a lot of it's nuanced. The truth is complicated, but the human brain craves simplicity. The philosopher Bertrand Russell once wrote, quote, one of the painful things about our time is that those who feel certainty are stupid, and those with any imagination and understanding are filled with doubt and indecision. As the poet Yeats said, quote, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Even Charles Darwin wrote, ignorance more frequently begets confidence than does knowledge. Or Shakespeare, the fool doth think he is wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. Or Confucius, 2,500 years ago, real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. You see, truth is complicated, but people crave simplicity. And the sheeple really don't want to think it through. They're not going to read 400 pages of an indictment. Of course not. They'll believe whatever Sean Handy tells them. And when Sean Handy tells them that black is white, they're like, fine. If he tells them that uh, trade is good for the country, they'll say, fine. If he says trade is bad for the country, they'll say, fine. Why work out all these complexities? I'd rather just be with my family. Why do I have to resolve the great philosophical and political questions of life? All those elitists keep telling me. And further than that, Trump's chumps want to feel smart. One of the things I talked about in a prior show was about the Nazi, um, the person who actually designed the, the structure of the, the Holocaust. Actually, Adolf Eichmann sort of figured out what gas needed to be done to kill the most people with the least effort. He actually was a failure in school. He didn't do well at all. Higher level thinking was not easy for him. He simply wanted to follow what others told him to do. And in fact, he was a joiner. He wanted to be part of a group. And he didn't want to think about what the group did so much as be a part. It's what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil. We need to understand who Trump's chumps are if we're ever going to dissuade them. And the last thing I'll say, and then I want to take a caller, um, is that it's important that we not, in kindness, 
fail to contradict crazy stuff thrown our way, right? Someone says, Barack Obama is born in Kenya, and we know them to be an idiot, or at least extremely ignorant. But if we say, you know, that's nice, keep your tinfoil hat on, just stay away from me, even though you're my cousin, my friend, my colleague, we help them think that this kind of thinking is permissible. We actually help them think that this is within the realm of normal society. One of the best ways to stop racism, and I've talked about this in past shows, is to simply call it out. We know that in the 1960s, there were lots of white kids screaming at those black kids, don't go to our school. Why? They really couldn't articulate why. Racism is hard to articulate. But everyone else is doing it. Look at the pictures of the lynching. There were thousands of people in the streets laughing and celebrating while an innocent person is dangling from a rope. It's the collective wisdom that allows atrocities to occur. Most people won't commit atrocities on their own. They will commit them only when commanded by a charismatic leader and every one of their neighbors follows suit. To the extent that you can call someone out, ask them not to join the crowd, show them some evidence that they won't want to look at because people don't want to admit they're wrong. But maybe as they keep pushing away the evidence, maybe as they see that rational, intelligent, thoughtful people, people who are willing to look at the facts, know that what they're saying is not only foolish, it's, it's, it's illogical. Maybe, just maybe, we can talk them out of it. It probably will require the Republican Party, though, to desert Donald Trump a bit, to actually put their country ahead of their party. And there are not many Republicans who are willing to do that at this point. John McCain is, but he's dying. Jeff Flake and Bob Corker are, but well, they're leaving Congress. Old Faithful from the Bronx is calling. I'll tell you what, Michael, I will get to you right after this break. If you want to join him, it's 888-488-MARK, 888-488-6275. We'll be right back right after this. He's a Bible-quoting, Constitution-loving, flag-waving, red-blooded, liberal American. He's Mark Levine. Give him a call now at 888-488-MARK. That's 888-488-6275. Hi, this is John Androsik of Five for Fighting, here for RAD, the entertainment industry's voice for road safety. You know, style is a personal thing, and your lifestyle is your business. But if you take it on the road, it becomes everybody's business. So please, plan ahead, designate before you celebrate. Friends, don't let friends drive drunk. A public service announcement brought to you by RAD, the National Association of Broadcasters, and the Ad Council. Steven. Who said that? Me, down here. Ugh, what are you, a yellow booger? I'm a banana slug, Steven. What are you doing in my room? I'm your sense of adventure. It's been a long time since we've had an adventure in the forest. Mom took me to the forest last year. I'm a slug, Steven. It took me a long time to get here. You're right. I should get out. Yeah, the forest is not that far away. Hey, Mom, come to the forest where the more adventurous you live. Check out discovertheforest.org for cool places nearby. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service and the Ad Council. Let's get crazy! In movies, when someone at a party jumps into a pool fully dressed, everyone cheers hey Janet, on and jumps into How do we deal with monsters too. like Get Stephen Miller? Life parties. Nobody I'll talk about that. that. Just a good question. Come on, jump in! Come on! Most party fouls are pretty dumb, but if you decide to drink and drive underage, you could lose your license and your freedom. Learn more at ultimatepartyfoul.org. Brought to you by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Thank you, Roy. I thought it was 40 something. Thank you. Here, and I know how important exercise is. Yeah. Last third party candidate to win pledge to elect Woodlands. Healthy kids stay active and play at least 60 minutes a day. Deborah, <laughs> you're right. Trying to reason with a Trumper is like pounding your head into a wall. And sometimes you have to rely on emotion. Because that's how they came up with their 
their uh, views. President Trump is said to see himself as a sort of Teddy so Roosevelt. So get to Michael after the TR, break. However, was known as a trust buster, while DT and has I'll become try to known as a trust Janet buster. Carpenter's question: How do we deal with people like Stephen Miller? It's a good event event question. To I'll end with that. Fifty proposals to stop big pharma from gouging American consumers with monopolistic drug pricing. People are rightly outraged that pill peddling giants exploit patients who have life-threatening diseases and routinely jack up prices on common drugs by some 10% a year. As a presidential candidate, Trump jumped on this hot issue, accusing drug makers of, quote, getting away with murder. So now, with typical modesty, he has revealed his plan to stop the ripoffs, calling his 50 proposals the, quote, most sweeping action in history to lower the price of prescription he drugs. He really for the thinks American his people. people are idiots. Yeah, sweeping, as in sweeping the problem under the White House rug. 50 is just a political number right. meant to puff up Trump's okay, plan as something right. big. But as one congressional Democrat about pointed out, only. all 50 amount to, quote, a sugar coated nothing pill. It even fails to include his own campaign promise to use the purchasing power of Medicare to negotiate lower prices for seniors. Far from feeling punished, Big Pharma itself felt it had gotten a warm presidential hug. Drug company stock prices went up immediately after the presidential speech. This is Jim Hightower saying, it's really no surprise that Trump is letting these corporate profiteers continue getting away with murder. After all, political posturing aside, he has stacked his administration with drug industry executives like Alex Azar, a former Eli Lilly honcho who is now his Secretary of Health. How revealing that Azar was standing right behind the president at the White House media event, beaming and applauding as Trump announced, well, a lot of nothing. And now, the voice of reason in an un... Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. Michael from the Bronx Old Faithful has been holding on a long time. Michael, you've got the floor. Hey, Mark. How you doing? I'm all right. I just want to remind you and my fellow listeners, let's not forget when it comes to Trump jumps, that it was Trump that encourages them to engage in violence, beat the you-know-what out of people, meaning their opponents, and he says to them, don't worry, I will take care of all your legal troubles. That's true. He's giving them green lights to commit these atrocities that everybody knows damn well that it's a crime and you'll be arrested for it. Sure enough, we see a bunch of his supporters being arrested and being um, sent to jail, even awaiting trial. They're probably waiting for Mr. Trump to come bail them out or to give them pardons, which won't happen, you know, right away. And in many ways, Trump will probably turn around, you know, turn the blind eye, that bear and say, I never knew them and all that. And then look yeah, what's happening now. What, what he's trying to do, yeah. uh, Michael, is he's trying to change what, what um, political philosophers call the Overton window. Basically, it's the realm of what's acceptable. Prior to Donald Trump, we might say we could argue over tax cuts. We could argue over Social Security, maybe. We could argue over how many immigrants to let in. But we all agreed that legal immigrants were fine uh, and that we should take in a certain number and that overt racism is bad. But the Overton window suggests that if you expand out into the fringes, you move the whole realm of discourse over one direction to another. So if you can be openly racist, if you can say that there are people in Charlottesville that are good on both sides, if you can actually grab a baby nursing at his mother's breast and lock him up in a cage and see that no one complains about it, you're moving the Overton window. You're suggesting, well, maybe I'm not that cruel, but if I can be that cruel to a three-year-old, maybe I can be cruel to someone seeking asylum, escaping rape uh, from El Salvador. So he's trying to, with violence, he's trying to change where we think of. And, and so one of the questions I was asked uh, by a Facebook listener is, how do we deal with the people who are doing that? People like Stephen Miller, this very creepy guy in his early 30s who truly is a racist, truly hates immigrants. Uh, the guy that, you know, very famously complained uh, that um, he shouldn't have to pick up after himself at school because they had janitors. 
um, the person who told a friend he couldn't be his friend anymore because that friend's Latino. I think the best way to deal with Trumpists and Stephen Miller and open racists is just to be true to who you are and don't be silent. When you see something, say something. When you see a crazy person, say they're crazy. Because it's different if it's just, I don't know, some mentally ill person in the streets who sees, sees ghosts. But when someone actively says something crazy, like Barack Obama wasn't born in America, or that Robert Mueller's investigation is a witch hunt, or tries to make up evidence that you know not to be true, you have to be worried that there may be influencing others. And you have to say out loud, this is crazy, this is un-American, this is treason. Keep fighting, folks. Keep up the resistance. This is Mark Levine signing off. Hello, I'm Casey Hoff. And I'm Shane Mason, and we're the host of Nurse Talk Radio. Here's what we're talking about this week. Here with us okay, to talk Mark. about this so-called bri-